Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another value-packed Tenant Cloud podcast. If you want to be a more informed, better educated, and successful landlord, then stay tuned. With over a decade of property management experience, we bring you short and sweet, bite-sized pieces of incredibly valuable property management tidbits in 15 minutes or less. It's pretty common for tenants to invite over friends and family, and some of those guests may stay for an extended period of time. And while that may seem harmless in and of itself, it can really turn into quite an ugly situation. You won't want to miss out on this incredibly important information about long-term guests in your rental and how to protect both yourself and your tenants from lengthy eviction proceedings. So today's podcast, we are going to be covering how to deal with long-term guests in your rental property. And it's important to understand the distinction between a tenant and a long-term guest. A tenant is someone who, as we all know, is named on the lease contract. They are legally liable for the rental and for the rental payments and damages in the rental and so on and so forth. Long-term guests are generally people who the tenant invites over, but they're not named on the lease. This could be, for instance, a friend or family member for the holidays or just for staying over a few nights or any type of long-term guest, anybody that stays longer than just coming over for a quick afternoon visit or uh, just coming to hang out for the day. They both occupy the rental though when they're there and they both take advantage of apartment amenities. So for instance, if a friend is invited over by a tenant of your rental property and you have a swimming pool, that guest oftentimes will use the pool or the gym or whatever. And so it's important that you have a well-planned strategy for detailing exactly who a long-term guest is and what defines them and also coming up with policies for your tenants as far as what is allowed in your rental when it comes to long-term guests. There's also an important line to be drawn with your tenants so that they know when the long-term guests need to leave, meaning if there is a time limit that they're allowed to be there. So we've drawn up a few different things. We have four key points here that we want to cover with you on this topic. And this is an important topic. It is something that you really don't think about until a scenario plays out that you weren't aware that could play out. Uh, For instance, I had a uh, tenant who ended up in the hospital and gave his keys to a friend to come and watch his place for a few days until the tenant was able to return to the apartment. Well, the hospital stay turned out to be longer than just a couple of days, and the tenant's friend ended up taking advantage of the situation and basically moved into the apartment. So the tenant then contacted us asking us to change the locks and move this friend so-called friend out of the apartment. And so we went to obviously call the police because the deadbolt was engaged and the apartment was not able to be opened. And there were a bunch of other things going on. I believe at the time they were smoking in the apartment. We could smell smoke and things of that nature. So we went to the apartment to change the locks per the tenant's written request. However, because we could not gain access to the apartment, we could not change the locks. And the police told us that this is not a criminal matter. This is a civil matter in the state of Texas at the time. And so what we learned through this process, through this unique scenario, is that in the state of Texas and in many other states, once a person has established residency inside of a rental unit, regardless of whether they are on the lease contract or not, they are essentially a tenant. They have right to access the rental. And even if we had changed the locks, that person legally was allowed to come to the leasing office and request a copy of a key for the new lock. And we would have been required to give it to them, even though they were not named on the lease contract. Why? Because they had established residency. They had moved in, they had brought their toothbrush, their blanket, their pillow, 
And the one concrete thing that absolutely defines residency, at least here, was that uh, if they had any mail delivered to them. So if they had had a piece of mail delivered to this rental, that was another component of establishing residency, regardless of whether, again, they were on the lease or not. So this very simple, seemingly innocent situation where someone needs help, they invite a friend to, hey, can you come watch my place for me? Uh, I'm in the hospital, then turns into, now this friend has essentially taken over the apartment. And this is true even if you invite someone into your home and you allow them to stay the night or two nights or three nights, once they're able to establish on a civil level on a legal level that they are now a resident of this address, you have to go through an eviction proceeding to get them out in many states. So I can't speak to your state individually, wherever you are listening to this, but this is something that you want to make sure that you have a firm and clear understanding of how the law works in your state. In the unlikely scenario that something like this plays out at one of your rental properties. So The first step out of four things is to make sure that you have everything documented on the lease because you want to be able to hold the uh, tenant who is named on your lease contract as the liable party for violating the lease rules or guidelines. So you need to have a very clear clause that addresses long-term guests and has a policy that outlines things like acceptable acceptable behavior, uh, rights, prohibitions, and other things like that. Now, it is important to note that I believe in most states, again, this is something you would want to verify in your uh, region or area, uh, your state, your city, is that you're typically not allowed to charge guest fees because tenants by law typically are allowed to invite people over. It is their domain. It is their rental. They are allowed to invite friends and family over and whatnot without having to pay any fees for that because they're already paying you rent. So, but you do want to outline other things about inviting long-term guests over. You also want to outline certain things like where their guests are allowed to park and you want to have those clearly defined on your rental property and have the proper signage up as well as far as uh, long-term tenants or even visitors go. And then also you typically are required to allow tenants to stay for a given amount of time within a uh, one month or six month period. So for instance, let's just say um, you're required to allow a guest to stay in a rental for up to 14 days in a six month period, for instance. Now, again, this is something that varies from state to state and county to county and city to city. So you want to check up on that, but you will want to check up on that and then detail it and document it in your lease agreement so that it's clear, concise, and it's in writing and that your tenant agrees to it at the time that they sign the lease. That way, if somebody invites a guest over and let's say your policy is they're only allowed to stay for seven consecutive days within a 30-day period or within a month. Well, if somebody invites a guest over and they've been there for 15 consecutive days in the month, that is a clear violation of your lease contract and now you have legal grounds to uh, start issuing lease violations and then eviction proceedings if this ends up turning out to be something where this person is not actually a guest. They've actually been invited to live there on a permanent basis. But you can't do any of that unless you have a long-term guest policy that is detailed in your lease contract. Number two, Beware of subletting and have subletting guidelines outlined in your lease contract or just simply state in your lease contract whether subletting is not allowed or if it is allowed. It's typically better to not allow it because subletting can get pretty messy and depending on your state or city, it can be even messier than others. Uh, In the state of Texas, it's pretty simple and straightforward but I know that that is not the case in other areas of the United States. So, but the bottom line is make sure that you have a clear policy when it comes to subletting, make sure that that topic is covered in your lease 
uh, because you don't want any gray areas uh, open to interpretation. The third thing is you want to be communicating with your tenants. Now, this is an important one because as we all know, uh, people do not typically read things very well or their reading comprehension is limited. And so this is true of everybody, uh, reading comprehension and just reading in general is something that a lot of people, A, just don't have time for, or B, they're just not interested in it. And so they just, they see a lease contract, they are like, yep, 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 good. I understand I'm paying X amount of dollars for rent. I don't need to read all this fine print. It's very rare that you will find somebody that reads all of the fine print in a lease contract. That's not to say that they shouldn't or that you shouldn't, but it's just a simple fact of life that people do not. So that being said, when it comes to this this topic, you do want to make sure that you communicate with your tenants about the policies that you have detailed in your lease agreement and your community policies about guests using uh, common areas and amenities at the property and any restrictions that go along with those. Uh, because a lot of tenants, they feel like it is their home as in they bought it and they own it when that is not the case. It is a rental and there are different guidelines when it comes to rentals for this type of thing uh, to protect the actual owner's investment in the rental property. So it is important that you communicate with them and make sure that they have a clear understanding of what your guest policies are. Number four, inspect the property occasionally. Again, this comes back to making sure that you are aware of what is going on at your property and making sure that there is not a scenario playing out that could end up being detrimental to you or to your rental property or to your tenant. Uh, as was the case with the story that I told you at the beginning of this podcast, where we had a resident who ended up in a hospital and needed somebody to take care of the rental for them. So uh, inspecting your rentals on a regular basis, whether that's quarterly or whatever, you're not going to catch everything, but just the fact that you are inspecting your property a, lets your tenants know that, hey, the landlord is active, they are aware of what's going on, they are paying attention, and uh, I want to make sure that I am following the rules and not taking advantage of a rental situation where maybe a landlord isn't paying attention and now I have three friends living in a one-bedroom apartment and we're all splitting the rent, but only one of us is on the lease contract and we're violating occupancy laws and so on and so forth. So you do want to make sure that you are conducting routine property inspections, uh, checking the condition of the property, identifying potential maintenance problems, and ensure that your renters are following the terms of your lease agreement regarding extra residents living there. And so that pretty much covers a lot of the topic on how to deal with long-term guests in your rental property. There are some other things, but for sake of time, we're not gonna get into uh, all those details about the nitty gritty part of it. Um, and as far as like step-by-step -step things you can do and so on and so forth. But this was to give you a general guideline, a general understanding of the fact that it really is a serious topic. It is a serious thing that you need to be aware of that it could potentially happen. It has happened and it will happen again. And it was a scenario that I was not aware of personally, even though I had been already in property management for years. And then this situation came up out of nowhere and I was completely unprepared and was not informed on the law regarding long-term guests to where I thought we could just change the locks and be done with it and everything, all the problems would be solved. The tenant wouldn't be able to get back the long-term guest who had extended their stay unwelcomed, would no longer be able to access the rental. None of that was the case. The law is typically not in the landlord's favor when it comes to this type of thing. So that being said, we thank you for taking the time to tune in to today's podcast. And we know you have a busy schedule, so it means a lot to us that you're spending this time with us. We hope that the information that we are providing you with is helpful, insightful, and that it improves your ability to better and more efficiently manage your rentals. 
And you can find this blog that this podcast is based off of at tenantcloud.com forward slash blog. And you can see this article titled How to Deal with Long-Term Guests in Your Rental Property published on October 31st, 2019. And we would look forward to speaking with you next time.